Jimmy Hoffa will serve as a primary character in Martin Scorsese's upcoming gangster picture, The Irishman. So who was Jimmy Hoffa and what significance does he play in American history? Hoffa was born in Brazil, Indiana on February the 14th, 1913. When he was 11, his family moved to Detroit, where he dropped out of school at the age of 14 to support his family through manual labour jobs. Hoffa worked with a grocery chain with poor wages, working conditions and practically no job security. The workers were naturally displeased with their situation and Hoffa, despite being very young at the time, became very involved in union organisational work and quickly rose to a position of leadership. His charisma and bravery captivated his fellow workers and in particular one incident when he left the grocery chain after refusing to work for an abusive foreman. His defiant nature got him noticed and in the early 1930s he was offered a role as an organiser with the local 299 of the Teamsters Union in Detroit. This union had 75,000 members at the time around Hoffa came on board, and with his help the numbers grew to almost three times this in the space of three years. By 1939, there were almost 500,000 members of the union, and come the 1950s after the Second World War, the number had reached a million. One of Hoffa's key contributions were, along with other union leaders, combining local union trucker groups into regional county sections, and then after a period of time, into one nationwide body, a process which took him and the Teamsters around 20 years and resulted in the Teamsters Union becoming one of the most powerful organisations of its kind in the US. The numbers gave power to the truckers and warehouse workers through strikes and boycotts for better contracts and working conditions. However, and this is where it gets interesting, many trucking unions in the areas operated by Hoffa, especially in the Detroit area, were influenced by the Mafia. In some cases, the mob actually controlled the trucking union groups. Now, if he's stopping truckers going to work, the mafia isn't getting their money, which is why he appeared on their radar, and in his attempt to unite the different union groups, he had to make deals and special arrangements with the mob. And as the Teamsters grew, so did the influence on it by organised crime. Through the 1930s and 1940s, Hoffa's power grew and grew as he fought off raids from other unions, in fact, he was so successful at what he did that he received a deferment from serving in World War II by arguing successfully that his work as a union leader was of more value to the country. As Hoffa's responsibilities grew, he spent less time in his original base in Detroit and moved all around the country, mainly in the capital. When the previous Teamsters president was convicted of fraud charges in 1957, Hoffa took over as the new president. In his mission to expand the union, he managed to bring practically all truck drivers in North America under one national contract. He then moved to bringing in airline workers and other transport workers with varying degrees of success. During this time, he was hit constantly with trials and investigations because of his ties to the criminal underworld and because of allegations of corruption and fraud, the first major one of which started in the 1960s after John F. Kennedy became president of the U.S., Kennedy appointed his younger brother Robert F. Kennedy as the Attorney General who for many years had been attempting to make one of these charges on Hoffa stick and once he became Attorney General he launched one of the strongest attacks on organised crime the country had ever seen. In 1964 one of these charges did stick and Hoffa was sentenced to 8 years in prison for attempted bribery of a grand juror. He was also convicted of improper use of the Teamsters pension fund later that year, as it had been discovered that Hoffa was handing illegal loans to organised crime figures. His full sentence was 13 years. After several unsuccessful appeals, Hoffa began his prison stretch in 1967, handing over temporary power of the Teamsters Union to a loyal follower, Frank Fitzsimmons. However, during Hoffa's time in prison, Fitzsimmons distanced himself from Hoffa and spread the power of the union to other members, which was a far cry from the days of Hoffa's reign, where most of the power was in his own hands. Less than five years after his initial imprisonment, Hoffa was released by the now president Richard Nixon. He was granted a one-of-a-kind, one-lump-sum pension from the Teamsters amounting to almost two million dollars. Because of the fact that the Teamsters had endorsed Nixon, the Republican Party's candidate, when before they had only ever endorsed Democratic candidates, questions were raised as to whether a deal had been made with the Republican Party to secure the release of Hoffa, but no conclusive evidence was ever forwarded. Either way, Hoffa was furious with the conditions of his release, which included him being unable to engage in union activities until 1980. It is thought that the current leaders of the Teamsters were the ones who asked Nixon for these very conditions, but Fitzsimmons denies this. 
Hoffa attempted to reclimb the power ladder but faced opposition from every corner. He had lost a significant amount of support he had gained in his spell as the president of the Teamsters Union. His plan was to return to Detroit where he would start his comeback with a local 299 at the grassroots levels, just like he had started in the beginning of his career. But then, sometime after 2.45 in the afternoon on July 30th, 1975, Jimmy Hoffa disappeared from the parking lot of a restaurant in a suburb of Detroit, in what would go on to be one of the most famous disappearance cases in US history. He had earlier told associates that he was going there to meet two mafia members, both of which later denied this and were found not to have been near the restaurant on the day of Hoffa's disappearance. To this day, the FBI have not come to a conclusion as to how Hoffa disappeared and the case remains unsolved and the man was legally declared dead exactly seven years after his disappearance. There have been many theories and claims as to how Hoffa disappeared and who was responsible but the one that concerns us is the confession of mafia hitman and longtime friend of Hoffa, Frank Sheeran, also known in the mob as the Irishman. Towards the end of his life, Sheeran confessed to author Charles Brandt that he, along with two other mobsters, one of which being Charles Chucky O'Brien, drove Hoffa to a house in Detroit. When the two other men had driven off, Hoffa and Sheeran entered the house where, under the orders of his mentor Russell Baffalino, Sheeran shot Hoffa and then cremated his body. This matches to DNA evidence found by the FBI from Hoffa's hair which was found in a car driven by Charles Chucky O'Brien. The idea thought to be most likely by the FBI is that organised crime figures had grown tired of Hoffa, whose efforts to regain control of the Teamsters was a threat to their control of the pension fund, and as a result, after many years of collaboration, they had him killed, by one of his best friends no less. As well as this, Sheeran later claimed that the mob was upset that Hoffa hadn't shown more gratitude over the murder of JFK, which Sheeran says the mob had a hand in, with Hoffa wanting to take him out due to him and his brother's attempts at prosecuting him. More on that in another video. Jimmy Hoffa will be portrayed by Al Pacino in Martin Scorsese's The Irishman. If you enjoyed this video then stay tuned as I plan to make several more giving basic background information on the main characters we will see in Scorsese's mob drama. Thank you for watching.